Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The Opipon Napiwan Cree Nation in northern Manitoba declared a state of emergency following a series of stabbings over the weekend. Now northern leaders are calling on the federal and provincial governments to help with the violence before it gets worse. With more, here's T.R. Wheatley. We demand more than immediate responses. An emotional chief Ducharme speaks outside a meeting about child welfare in downtown Winnipeg with other female chiefs offering her a hand in support. Her community, Opipinapiwin Cree Nation, is under a state of emergency after two separate stabbings early Saturday morning. Immediate thinking was, you know, we have to protect our people, our children, and immediate lockdown was in place. It lasted 36 hours and has since been lifted. Now a curfew remains in effect from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. until after September long weekend. These bandit solutions, they're not long term. Ducharme and other chiefs here can help but to think about the tragic stabbings in James Smith Cree Nation back in 2022. The mass deaths in that community resulted in financial support for mental health services and a healing centre, something Ducharme wants in her First Nation. Our members are ready you know to go to treatment and so on but we don't have the resources right on our land it's way in winnipeg or thompson and they have a long waiting list hilda anderson perez is a band member who echoes that a healing lodge is essential to healing entire families because if you're continuously taking people out of the community you know treatment supports that are not effective and they're coming back they're coming back to the same environment with no supports or resources like governments have to really take a community-based approach if they truly want to address, you know, the violence in the community. Chief Angela Levisser of the neighboring Nisichoyasik Cree Nation agrees but says there are other problems in the north that need to be addressed immediately. Since 2021, we have seen a 40% increase in violence in MKO nations. Levisser says more than half of the 26 First Nations in northern Manitoba only have RCMP presence for a week at a time. How would people in Winnipeg and Manitoba feel if they did not have police presence for three weeks out of the month? There would be anarchy, there would be chaos, and that is what you see in our First Nations communities. She's also calling on the provincial government to help curb the flow of the illegal sales of alcohol in First Nations. They purchased a case of what they call Mickeys. They're obviously bootlegging. Where is the regulation? Regulation, she says, will make a dent in helping curb the violence in the north. As of airtime, there has been no response from the federal or provincial government. T.R. Wheatley, APTN National News, Winnipeg. From July to September, the Assembly of First Nations is traveling across Canada to meet with regional chiefs to discuss the $47.8 billion settlement agreement on the long-term reform of First Nations child and family services. All of this happening before the AFN Special, Special Chiefs Assembly in mid-September here in Winnipeg. This week, AFN National Chief Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak is in Winnipeg meeting with Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. Woodhouse Nipanak says she's had tough but constructive discussions with the Chiefs on what to do with the multi-billion dollar settlement money including using the money to create or improve First Nations-run child welfare systems that focus on prevention, not apprehension. She says the chiefs from across the country will have a final say and a final vote, but admits that although the agreement is not perfect, it is the largest settlement in Canadian history, and she believes it's a fair chance for Indigenous children. Chiefs can put forward potential amendments at the Special Chiefs Assembly in Winnipeg, September 17th to the 19th. We're finally having a real talk, a real discussion about what we need to do to change the outcomes. Because many of those people out there that are on the street, they come from this system. We're breaking people down and we need to start lifting people up, building families, pulling them back together once again. And we need to support families. We also need to support our grandparents. There's too many grandparents in First Nations communities across this country that have been um, assuming that role, rightfully so. That's how traditionally it was done in our communities. But we're not even giving them support. This is very important that Manitoba chiefs' voices are heard because, unfortunately, Manitoba has the highest representation of First Nations children in care. So we need to make sure 
that we are looking at the agreement through a Manitoba-specific lens. The National Chief will be in Saskatchewan tomorrow and Alberta later this week. Meanwhile, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs say they are offended and disappointed after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau appointed former broadcaster Charles Adler to the Senate. They're now calling on Governor General Mary Simon and the Prime Minister to rescind Adler's appointment over comments he made on air in 1999. At the time, uh, Adler called Indigenous leaders uncivilized boneheads and intellectually moribund during a protest by Indigenous peoples at the Manitoba Legislature. Adler also criticized Indigenous leaders' decision to live on reserve because it lacks free enterprise and responsible government. The AMC calls Adler's comments vulgar and racist and wants a senator who values inclusion, respect, and reconciliation. Adler spent decades working in broadcast journalism and for 20 years hosted a conservative radio talk show on Winnipeg's CJOB. He's now an incoming independent senator for Manitoba. Here's some of what Manitoba chiefs had to say about his appointment today in Winnipeg. In my view, when you give such a prestigious and honorable appointment to a man who is well known for making derogatory and offensive comments towards Indigenous people, that speaks volumes. And I ask, how do you go from appointing a First Nations hero and role model like Judge Marie Sinclair to the complete antithesis of such an individual? You are rewarding discrimination. You are rewarding racism. You are rewarding stereotyping of First Nations and Indigenous people. And it's very shameful and it's a dark day. They're pretty derogatory comments when it comes to our people. And people forget that we are the first people of this country. And for comments like that to be made from someone that is uh, going to be appointed, appointed into the Senate is not acceptable. In a statement to APTN News, Charles Adler said, quote, I am accountable for what I say and do. I have reached out to the Grand Chief and the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs to request a face-to-face -face meeting. I'm still waiting to hear back from them. A man accused of murdering a Rocky View County worker and shooting another is set to make a court appearance today, and the RCMP is still on the hunt for his alleged accomplice. RCMP allege Penner and 28-year-old uh, Elijah Blake Strawberry set a stolen vehicle, uh, a truck they were using on fire on a range road east of Calgary. A Rocky View County worker, Colin John Huff, stopped at the burning truck to offer help, not knowing it had been deliberately torched. Police say he was then shot and killed by the pair. After the pair made it off with a work truck, a large manhunt was sparked. Strawberry still remains on the loose and is believed to be in Alberta. The Ontario government has announced that it will shut down supervised drug consumption sites within 200 metres of any school or child care centre and prevent new ones from being built. One of the things that we have embedded with our announcement is if you have a site that is operating within that 200 meter restriction, um, you will have to make a decision. You can shut down that site or you can transition into a heart hub and offer the, the uh, treatments so that people get out of the addictions. Ontario's health minister says new centres will be built with a focus on support and treatment for those who use drugs. The new rules will mean the closure of nine provincially funded sites by the end of March. Five of those locations are in Toronto. Critics of the move say it will result in a rising death toll and more people overdosing in public. The accounting firm in charge of a Yukon mine that recently experienced a cyanide spill has fired the mining company's CEO. According to a report by the CBC, Price Waterhouse Coopers fired Victoria Gold CEO John McConnell over the weekend. The accounting firm was appointed as the mine's receiver last week after an application was filed by the Yukon government. 
The company's Eagle Gold Mine Site, located on the traditional territory of the Nacho Nayaktan, experienced a heap leach failure in late June. The failure caused cyanide to be released into the surrounding environment. McConnell said in an email Monday he was proud of the company's achievements. Well, we'd like to hear what you think about anything you see here. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, go to our website. That's aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. A Winnipeg park some call home is about to be closed down to the public. That story and more still to come. Welcome back. The Air Canada Windows Park has long acted as a gathering place and even a home for some people experiencing homelessness in Winnipeg. It's located just outside APTN headquarters in the downtown core. However, next week it's scheduled for a year-long reconstruction as part of a $2.5 million redevelopment project. Reporter Sierra Benton spoke with some of the people who call the park home. What do you like about the big at the Air Canada Window Park in downtown Winnipeg, a blueprint of the park's future is sprawled out on a concrete slab. But not everyone shares the same vision. Over the years, dozens have come to call the park, located outside APTN headquarters, home. Next week, the park is scheduled for demolition, leaving some wondering where to go. Dave Thomas, who is originally from the Roseau River Anishinaabe First Nation, says he's been coming to the park for decades. Like I'm, I'm at home. It does. All my friends are here. I meet new friends. And I make a little change. Last year, the city announced a $2.5 million redevelopment of the park, located at the corner of Portage Avenue and Carlton Street. The city says they consulted with community partners, including park users, to identify needs. The new park will include areas for storytelling, a food vendor kiosk, and a stage. But Irma Harper, who has found community at the park, wants it to stay the same. This is, this is a nice place, seriously. Why, why are they trying to change it? Are they trying to change it to, to Central Park? Central Park is over there, not too far. So they could go over there. If they don't like it, never mind. But this is First Nation grounds here. At the park, a diversity of languages, from English to Anishinaabemowin to Cree, are spoken. At the same time, safety concerns related to drugs and violence have emerged over the years. Damien Saunders, who comes from Norway House Cree Nation in northern Manitoba, stops by every few weeks to connect with people. I come, I come see my family out here like, to come sit. As the demolition date gets closer, Norma Hart, who wanted to share her story, but not her face, worries about finding a new place to sleep. I sleep everywhere. Where I'm going to find a good spot, that's where I sleep. After closing for construction, a spokesperson from the city of Winnipeg says the park is expected to reopen in summer 2025. Sierra Bettens, APTN National News, Winnipeg. 230 years ago, the Chippewas of Caldwell were pushed off their land. In 2011, Caldwell settled a long-standing claim with the federal government and gained status four years ago. In the fall of 2020, a 200-acre plot was purchased to build new homes. And earlier this week, people moved back to their ancestral lands in Leamington, Ontario. Caldwell Chief Mary Duckworth joins us now for more. Chief Duckworth, thanks so much for being with us and congratulations on the new homes for the community. Thank you for having me, Dennis. Uh, what does this mean for Caldwell First Nation? 
for Coldwell First Nation, it rem, rem, it, I feel it's, it's emotional for me to talk about, but what it means for Coldwell First Nation is for our citizens to move on to our First Nation, our territory, and reside as a community, Dennis, which we haven't been able to do in a really long time. Um, as you know, we were forcibly removed from our homelands and scattered, and now this is a chance for us to reclaim our land back and come together as a community and celebrate. Yeah, for those who are unaware, uh, can you tell us a bit about why Caldwell First Nation didn't have homes or land to even build them on until relatively recently? Yeah, Caldwell First Nation has a long history um, with the the Crown and what happened was um, there was a obligation from the Crown um, to allow us to reside on our homelands after the War of 1812 and this didn't happen. So prior chiefs and councils took action and started to write the letters to, you know, to the king, to the queen, and uh, try to come to an understanding of why this didn't happen and eventually had to engage Canada to uh, hold them to the uh, treaty promise. Where was everyone living? Um, I can tell you, Dennis, we're all over Turtle Island, but I'll tell you that the majority of people live within Southwestern Ontario. Um, we had uh, many family members that remained in the Leamington area and then many surrounding this area. So we are, you know, it's a fair distance to, when we come to get together for meetings and, you know, have activities. But um, for a small First Nation, we, you know, we've been together over the years and kept our family ties and kept in contact with each other. Uh, how many units, I guess, uh, are available and when can some members begin moving in? Thanks. There's 28 units available um, and 28 members will be moving in. We did a call out to the community. We only had 28 and thankfully, Dennis, 28 applied. And so we had members move in three weeks ago, uh, four families, and this week we have four more families moving in and it will be an eventual move in until all the units are occupied. So full up already, uh, any plans for or hopes for future developments? Yes, we are. We um, have serviceable lots right now and we're engaging our community to see what they would like us as leadership to continue on with and, and in the way of housing. Our housing right now is net zero. And so uh, it's important to, that we leave a, a not a big footprint, as you know, Dennis, but take care of um, uh, mother nature and, and everything that it does for us. So we're really careful on our decisions as a community. Well, Chief Duckworth, we'll leave it there. But again, congrats to you and your members and uh, appreciate you taking some time for us. Thank you, Dennis. Nice looking homes. Two First Nations in Saskatchewan are taking a different approach when it comes to food security. That story and more still to come after the break. Time now for our photo of the day. On August 4th, James Moore had the amazing privilege to see this night sky while at Cat Lake. An amazing image of the Northern Lights mingled with the cosmos of space. Thanks, James, for that. To be our next photo of the day, you can send your photos to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, showers and 24 in Halifax, 20 with rain in Fredericton. Sun's out in 21 in Kujuac, 15 in Nain. Showers and 15 in Montreal, partly cloudy and 22 in Valdor. Sunny and 24 in Sault Ste. Marie, rain and 22 in North Bay. 23 in Thunder Bay, showers and 28 in Sioux Lookout. Smoky and 27 for God's Lake, 27 and partly cloudy in Norway House, 27 in Winnipeg, showers and 27 in Dauphin, 26 with rain in Regina, 25 in showers in Saskatoon, 26 and rain for Meadow Lake and La Ronge. Smoky across parts of northern Alberta, 17 in high level, 20 for Fort Chippewan, 24 with rain in Edmonton, 26 in Lethbridge. 18 with showers in Victoria, 25 and rain in Kamloops. 
18 in Prince George with showers, 20 and rain in Smithers, 13 in Old Crow, 20 in Whitehorse. Rain and 20 in Yellowknife, sun's out and 18 in Norman Wells. Plus two with snow in Saks Harbor, cloudy and 13 in Politech. 16 with rain in Chesterfield, 21 in showers in Baker Lake. Minus one in Resolute, 14 with rain in Joe Haven. With the goal of enhancing food security for Indigenous peoples, two First Nations in Saskatchewan are building aquaponics greenhouse facilities. CTV's Sierra D'Souza Butts has the story. We think that there's the potential here to feed lots of First Nations, lots of communities. Members of Little Black Bear and Muscopeding Soto First Nations are one step closer to enhancing food security by building two new aquaponics facilities. Aquaponics is kind of two businesses within one and it's aquaculture which is fish farming and hydroponics which is growing plants uh, without soil. Each facility will sit on an acre of land, one located at Little Black Bear and the other at must competing. Belgard explains that each greenhouse will be split down the middle containing one section for aquaculture and the other for hydroponics. However, both parts will be working collectively to produce fresh vegetables and fish. In some of those hydroponic systems you might need to be adding fertilizers or things like that to help your plants grow. Uh, in this case, all of the wastewater that comes from our fish is what is helping to grow these plants. Currently, both nations are in the early stages of planning for the developments. Mike Ajakute of Muscapeding Soto Business Developments says the project provides the nation economic opportunities, but most importantly, sustainable food production. Food sovereignty is key to Indigenous people and it allows us to break free of the dependency on external food sources like grocery stores, corner stores, stores that don't generally have nutritious foods for Indigenous peoples. Adding, both aquaponic facilities will serve as an educational hub for post-secondary students. Well, we're bringing them to the table to see what's happening here and hopefully uh, it provides generational opportunities for them to venture into this space because we, we are Indigenous people and we believe wholeheartedly in the land and what it provides. So we want to encourage our young people to also look at opportunities like this. Belgard says Little Black Bear has already purchased its greenhouse and is currently working on the land in preparation for the site with plans of getting it ready by spring 2025. For Indigenous Circle, I'm Sierra D'Souza Butts in Yorkton. Sounds like a pretty great idea. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, though, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and be sure to join Creason here at 1 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow for your first look at the day's news. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGuitch. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. An encore presentation of Face to Face is up next. Have a great night.